think it's going to be an intro. Well, I think I'm going to have fun today because I don't normally get to talk to philosophers from your sort of areas as well. So generally, I'm a philosopher of mind, in particular philosopher of perception. Um, and so, yeah, it would be interesting to get some feedback from people who are less interested in those topics or less focused on those topics. Okay. Um, I am going to be talking to some degree about time, uh, but I also am going to be talking to quite a bit about perception, particularly auditory perception, and also a little bit about philosophy of depiction as well. Okay, so I'll just sort of get started. So hopefully you can tell me if you can't see my slides properly, and I'll read them through. Uh, also, I have a habit of speaking quite quickly, of starting normal and then faster and faster and faster. So just wave at me or mouth slow down if I go too fast. Okay, so here are my aims today. My aim, first aim is to tell you that sounds, well, not that sounds don't exist, but that we do not hear sounds, that any philosophical approach to auditory perception should not include sounds. Okay, this is something, this is an old song for me. This is something I've been talking about for a couple of years now. Not that many people have been convinced yet, but let's find out. Um, where I think maybe there'll be the most uh, connection between the stuff you guys are interested in and the stuff I'm interested in is my account of hearing events, which I'll talk about. Um, there's going to be quite a bit about persistence and how we perceive objects as persisting as well. And that sort of touches on debates in metaphysics as well, so going back to people like David Lewis. Okay, and I also want to argue that audio playback can be thought of as a type of image perception. What I mean by audio playback is just whenever you press play on an electronic device and you hear something. Okay, the most common way of saying that would be sound reproduction, but because I don't want to say we hear sounds, I can't say that. So when I say something like hearing a recording or hearing playback, this is what I mean. Okay? The plan, first I'm going to introduce my account, then I'm going to show you that uh, audio playback could be a potential difficulty for my account, then I'm going to show you why it's not, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more about what it means to hear a recording of my account. So, soundless audition. So let's start at the beginning. Okay, so first bit of terminology for you. Source events. Source events are real life events. Um, so we're not talking about recordings yet or electronic playback yet. We're just talking about real, ordinary stuff. The types of events in the world that cause auditory experiences. So most obviously, well, so yeah, movements or activities of material objects which cause those objects to vibrate, create the sound waves in the air, the sound waves hit your ears, and then you have an auditory experience. Okay? Classic things would be things like collision, so doors slamming, or me clapping my hands, maybe a bowling ball rolling down a bowling alley, or a glass smashing. Okay? I'm going to be talking mainly about solid material objects here, but other types of source events will involve liquid, so you can hear the liquid being poured, because again, the liquid is vibrating, disturbing the air. Uh, you could even maybe think about sort of compressed air leaking out of a, a tyre, for example, and you get that sort of as well. And maybe we could think about that as a source event. So, although I'm not going to talk about this, everything I say about material objects and hearing, I think you could probably apply to liquids and gases as well. Okay. So, source events are the events that cause auditory experiences. Where do sounds fit in? Here is... The classical, basically, there is a classically in auditory perception, there is a divide between what I'm going to be calling people who think it se think that sounds are separate individuals. Uh, this is the first option. Okay, so typically, if you think about what is a sound, you think of a sound wave. Okay, and so on this account, the the source event produces something, produces the sound wave, and then the sound wave is what you hear, or what you hear most directly. Okay, so when I do this, sound waves come across, hit your eardrums, the sound is this thing coming from here to there. Okay, uh, and that's what I mean by separate sounds, separate from the source event, separate from the objects 
participating in the source event. Okay, um, there are actually other versions of the separate sound view which I'm not going to go into very much here at all, but just here's a quick reason why sound waves are not a good candidate for what we hear, which is think about the location of where sound waves are and when, when I click my fingers, for example, and where you hear what you hear to be located. So if you close your eyes and you do that, then you can hear that what is happening is happening over here. Okay? But if you think about the sound waves, the sound waves are all around you, right? They've bounced off those walls, they're hitting that ear and that ear. Okay, so why so a problem that people have thought about about why we maybe do not hear sound waves is they're in the wrong place. They're at your ear and between your ear and the object and at the object. Okay, so that's one reason for thinking that separate sound views are problematic. Um, someone like Casey O'Callaghan has still endorses what I'm calling a separate sound view, it's still a separate individual to the event, but he would say it's a medium disturbing event. So when I bang the table, he would say that the sound is here. It is the event of the air being disturbed by the vibrating table, but not the sound wave. So it's basically sandwiched between the vibrating object and the sound waves propagating through the air. So, and he thinks that we can still have separate sounds, but those separate sounds are located in the right place as to what you're hearing. So, first view, separate sounds, uh, precedent in Aristotle. Second view, sounds as properties, uh, historical precedent in Locke, who talks of sounds as secondary properties. Okay, so here the idea is that sounds are not things that sources produce, source events produce, but they are properties of either the event itself or the objects involved in that event. Okay. I'm not going to go into number two or number three here, but uh, Kovicki, who has since given up this idea, Kovicki's view is quite interesting and sort of gives you an intuitive idea of what this view would be. Okay, so he thinks that, he did think that sounds are stable vibratory dispositions of objects, which are revealed when that object is caused to vibrate. Okay. The analogy here would be with a reflectance theory of colour. So some people, you say, well, what is a colour? And they would say, well, what a colour is in the real world is a colour is the object's disposition to reflect light of such and such a frequency. That's what being red or being green is. And Kovicki would say exactly the same thing with sounds. Okay, Sounds are properties and the, the sound of this table can be thought of as its disposition to vibrate at frequency x. Okay? And the idea here would be, in the same way you turn on the light, the colour of the object is revealed, according to Kalviki, you bang on the table, and the sound of the table is revealed. Okay? So that's, that's one form of a sound as property view. I think the property views get something right, but I'll talk about, but I also think they get something quite wrong. So we'll talk about that a bit in a moment. Now, back to sources. Talk, by the way, I promise you I'll get to time at some point. Um, so, I told you that we hear sounds when source events occur. Now, you might want to think, well, do we hear the source events as well? Okay. Bartley uh, said, in truth and strictness, nothing can be heard but sound. Okay. Everybody but everybody who currently works on audition does not agree with this. They think... All, not only are sounds heard, but the source events that I told you about on the first slide are also heard as well. Okay, so you don't just hear the chime, you hear the ringing of the bell. Okay. Uh, here are some reasons that people have given why we should think source events are heard as well. First, immediacy of awareness from our experiences. Okay, so if you hear pretty much anything, especially natural source events, you very almost yeah, immediately become aware of what is happening to what. That a wooden thing is colliding with another wooden thing. That a fragile thing is colliding and destroying itself on a harder thing. Okay, so pretty much any noise I can make in this room, you would be able to understand what is happening to what. With that. Okay, another one, straightforward one, is source events stand in straightforward causal relations to auditory experiences. Okay, so lots of philosophers of perception have said that one condition on us perceiving a thing 
is for that thing to be in the right sort of causal relation to my perception experience. So, for example, if I look at that microphone, the fact that it, the fact that the microphone is reflecting rays of light in my retina, go to my visual cortex, causing a visual experience means I see the microphone. Even if I was if I was hallucinating an exact copy of the microphone and my eyes are open, but that microphone is not the causal component, not the thing that's causing me to have the experience, then most people would say that I'm not really seeing the microphone. Okay? So you can, of course, quibble about these, what exactly the right sort of causal relation is, but intuitively we can think that to perceive something has to be in the right simple sort of causal relation. Source events seem to fall into this category. And third, and I think most importantly, the reason why we think we hear source events is because source events are important to us. Okay? If you think about how our ancestors evolved and what they needed to keep track of, okay, they didn't need to keep track of movements of air, particularly. Okay? They needed to keep track of the things that were causing the air to move. Okay? So there's the old joke about the four Fs, which is our ancestors needed to keep track of things you can fight with, things you can feed, things you can flee from, and things you can reproduce with. Okay? All of these things are material objects moving, none of these things are sound waves, so there's a good reason to think that we evolved to track the material objects. Yeah, and maybe not the sound waves themselves. Okay, so just to stress, everybody working on auditory perception thinks we hear source events as well. So the question is, where do these theories of sounds fit in with the idea that we hear source events? Okay? People who um, endorse property views sometimes think that property views are at an advantage here. Okay, as Kovicki says, he says, if sounds are still individuals distinct from material things, we risk putting events of interest, by which I mean source events, at one remove from listeners. Okay, so it seems like you've got to go, if you believe in separate sounds, it seems like you've got to go a slightly indirect route to get to saying you're, you're hearing your sources here. Okay? You've got to hear the sound wave or the medium disturbance, and by hearing that, you get to hear the clapping of the hands, the ringing of the bell, this sort of stuff. Okay? And people, I mean, people who endorse separate sound views, they do. they do. They try and give us theories about how this happens. For example, O'Gallaghan would say that we hear sounds as parts of source events. And he would say in the same way that we... I see the whole table by just seeing its front-facing surfaces. I hear the source event by hearing the sound part of it. That would be one way to go. Um, other people have said, well, we hear sounds as having been caused by source events. And somehow the having been caused by allows us to hear the source event. Okay, but this is still quite a complex structure for audition. So if you look at the bottom, the separate sound people, they need two individuals, so a sound wave, a medium disturbance, and a relation, and the source event. Whereas the property guys, they can go straight to the source, as it were, okay? Because they would say that, well, we just hear source events, and we hear sounds as properties of source events. So it's a much more parsimonious structure, which you might think, if we want to sort of value parsimony, maybe the property people are at an advantage here if a desiderata of auditory perception is hearing source events, okay? I think these property guys are wrong. So, um, as I've said, a good reason for thinking that we hear sound sources is that we have an interest, and our ancestors had an interest in sound sources. Okay, source events, I mean. Okay? We have an interest in the properties of the objects involved in these source events. Okay, we're interested in whether it's a big thing, a small thing, a heavy thing, a light thing whether it's made out of wood, whether it's made out of metal, all of these sorts of things, okay? What we're not interested in is what Kovicki would say is the sound, which is the vibratory proper, the stable vibratory disposition of the object. This, whatever frequency this table vibrates at is not very useful to me, or not very interesting to me. Why would my ancestors have evolved to keep track of how objects vibrate, okay? So as soon as you get that, as soon as you add sound properties into the equation, it seems to me you have more or less the same type of complex, problematic view that the separate sound guys have. Okay, because this, you can either say, well, 
we don't really hear the interesting properties. So it's like a quasi Barclayan view. We hear the sound property and we somehow have to infer the weight, the size, the shape of objects, uh, which doesn't seem very appealing because it's close to just having a Barclayan, we only hear sounds view. On the other hand, if you say that we somehow hear the interesting properties, weight, mass, material properties, through the sound property, it seems you're going to have to have this same sort of complex relationship as the separate sound guys as well. Okay, so I don't think the prop, even though the property guys think that they solve the problem, I think they have exactly the same difficulty as the separate sound guys. So, here are three ways this debate could continue. First debate is the separate sound guys, the property guys, could keep arguing about the merits of their respective views and whether one or the other is better at allowing us to hear sources. Okay? Second, we could give up on source hearing. We could say Barclay was right all along. Okay? We, don't, we don't hear the ringing of the bell, we just hear the chime. Okay? But there's a third option. And what I, want to, what I want to push here in this first third of the talk is why don't we just get rid of sound? Okay? Why not just say we hear sources and just remove any talk of sounds, however you conceive them, from our theory of auditory perception here. Okay? We just hear source events. We just hear material objects doing stuff. Nothing in this, yeah, nothing in this picture needs to be called a sound. Okay? Um, as I mentioned, we've got good reasons to think that we hear source events. As far as I can see, we don't really have any good reasons for thinking that we hear sounds of any type. Just to try and push this a little bit more, imagine beginning an inquiry into visual perception with this paragraph here in the slightly smaller text. Okay? Whatever we see, we definitely see visions. Anything else we might see, material objects or rainbows or smoke, we must see via the seeing of visions. It is important, therefore, to investigate the nature of visions. What are they? Are they properties? Are they separate individuals in their own right? Uh, and also, we need to investigate how visions allow for us to see the things we might want to say we see as well, such as objects, such as rainbows, such as smoke. This seems a crazy way to begin an inquiry into visual perception to me, right? Just to make up this particular thing, say, well, it must exist. What is it? How does it allow us to see anything else? Now, you might think that the Visiounds view is somewhat similar to the sense data view of perception. Okay? But I think it's even worse. The sense data view was put forward to try and solve a problem. Okay? It, was to, it was to try and solve the problem of hallucination or the problem of illusion. Okay? As far as I can see, there's no analogous problem that sounds are solving for us here. Okay? The second thing is, people who believed in sense data, for, um, they agreed more or less on what, sense datum, what a sense datum was. They would say it's an individual that bears properties. People who say sounds exist and that we hear sounds don't even agree that whether sounds are properties or individuals. Okay? So it just seems a crazy way to me to begin an inquiry by just saying we must hear sounds. Okay? And often when I sort of put this point, uh, people often respond by saying something like, well, what about can't sounds be this? And I think that's the wrong question, that's the wrong way to go. The question should not be, can't sounds be X? The question should be, why do we need sounds in the first place? So, this is what I think audition should look like. It's going to become a little clearer as I continue. Um, Okay, on a sounders approach, we hear, we auditorily represent, if you want to do it like that, uh, the same things that we see. So we hear objects and we hear the properties of objects. Okay? In particular, I'm thinking of pro properties uh, yeah, like material constitution, such as woodenness or metalness, uh, density or hollowness, these sort of things. Okay? In the same way that we typically think that we see properties such as color, or size, or shape, or maybe texture. I want to say we hear objects as, yeah, as being wooden, or being metal, or being hollow, or being solid, or being heavy, or being light. Okay? We hear these objects. We hear these objects to participate in events such as colliding, such as rolling, such as scraping, such as breaking. And something else which I'm not going to talk about today as well is I also think that we hear space surrounding source events as well. Okay, so especially in reverberant rooms, 
So if I kidnap you, blindfold you, take you to a cathedral and make you clap your hands, you will know pretty much that you're in a large space rather than a small space. And I have argued elsewhere that this is a case of representing the space auditorily. Okay? I'm not going to talk about space today, I'm going to talk just about the activities part and the events part. So I want to say that we hear and see more or less the same things, but of course we hear them in a different way to how we see them. And I'm going to elaborate on what I mean by a different way a little bit later on in the talk. Um, but just as a little placeholder so you get the idea, think about touch and vision. It's very clear, well, it seems intuitive to say that I can touch this table and I can see this table. Okay? But at the same time, there's something intuitively different between me seeing the table and touching the table. So, that's my view, in a nutshell, about how audition should be. This is how I think a defender of sounds should... This should be the general strategy that someone who wants to go against my view needs to take. Or at least a very good way of trying to prove me wrong. And that would be to say that if, they can, if we can find a case where I am not... When there is no source event, but I'm still hearing something then that seems to be a good case for a case when we hear sounds. Okay, because if there's no source of end and I'm still hearing something, what else am I hearing? Probably I'm hearing a sound. That seems like a good, a good general strategy. Okay, and O'Callaghan says something similar to this. He says sounds may be audible independently from sources. A particular sound may be heard without hearing its source. This readily explains a variety of attention and demonstrative reference to particular sounds that does not involve attending or referring demonstratively to their sources. Okay. If O'Callaghan is right, and we do get situations where we hear sounds independent of sources, everything I've just said in the last five minutes has been wrong and I've wasted your time. Okay. There are various, I think, different types of argument could be made with this general strategy. Today, I'm going to focus on just one, which is audio playback. And it is very natural to think that when you press play on your phone, on your tape deck, on your car stereo, <coughs> it's very natural to think that pressing play causes sounds to come out of the speaker. Okay? So that's, yeah, this is a very intuitive thing, I think. Plenty of philosophers think something like this as well. So we've got Mike Martin. He says, in sound recording, one captures and reproduces the very sounds that are made on some particular occasion. Roger Scruton, recently disgraced philosopher Roger Scruton, um, so that's not true, um, says audio technology allows for sounds to be detached completely from their source and listened to in isolation. We can, uh, and then we've got Soterio who says we can then allow that when we hear recorded sounds, the bearers of acoustic properties that we hear are pure audibilia, pure audibilia that we can hear without hearing their source events. Okay, so there seems to be sort of quite a strong intuition in the philosophy on auditory perception that recordings, playback of recordings, causes sound to appear. And so, yeah, this gives a problem for someone like me who wants to say sounds don't exist. Now, one strategy that might be tempting, but I don't think is going to work, would be to, to think of uh, radios and stereos as illusion generators. Okay, so if I press play and there is a recording of somebody clapping their hands, then you could say, ah, well, maybe the recording is causing me to have the illusion, illusory experience of some hands clapping. It seems as though there's a source of effect taking place of a hand clapping, but in fact there is no such thing, so therefore it's illusory. Okay? This might be a strategy you want to do, but I don't think it's a very good one. The reason why is because, one, it would mean illusions are all over the place, that we have auditory illusions, every day. We hear auditory recordings every day, so it means that we have auditory illusions every day. Generally, in philosophy of perception, people don't want to allow an account of any type of perceptual modality to have a plethora of different illusions all the time. Okay. Second, and this is going to be important for what I say in a moment, if you think, if you think a stereo is an illusion generator, uh, then you also need to take into account the fact that almost always playback is a very unconvincing illusion, okay? Almost always, when you press play and you hear something, it's very clear that you're hearing a recorder, 
Okay? In almost every situation. Of course, it's possible sometimes if I've got a super good hi-fi and the speakers are placed exactly the right place, then I can fool you to think a source event is occurring. But very, very, very often, let's say 90% of the time, uh, these, illusions, th these illusions are very unconvincing illusions. Okay? So this is, again, this is not a good way, this is a good, a good reason to reject the illusion strategy. Okay? So I still need a strategy to show you that you're not hearing sounds when somebody presses play. Brings me, come on, come on, come on, to this part. So, I just told you about the illusion part, and I said, well, think about recording of a hand clapping. On a recording of a hand clapping, in a way, it sounds like a hand clapping, but in a way, it's clearly recognizable as not a real hand really clapping. It's recognizable as a recording. Okay. Then, think about, in the visual perception, we have this type of experience, experience all the time. It's kind of a thing, but at the same time, it's clearly not of a thing. And what I mean by this, this is pictures. Okay. When you see a picture of a horse, you can say, well, it's kind of, I can kind of see a horse. But at the same time, you can say, well, I'm still not seeing a horse, I'm seeing this other thing. Okay. So, this brings us to pictures and something called twofoldness. Okay, so philosophers interested in depiction, they will say, well, seeing a picture, you kind of see, you kind of have content of two different things simultaneously. Your perceptual content includes the object that is depicted. So if it's a picture of a horse, your content includes somehow horse. Okay, visual perceptual content includes horse. But at the same time, your visual perceptual content includes the picture surface. So the canvas, or the paper, or the screen. Okay, so these are the two folds of seeing pictures. So, okay, so, and this is just a phenomenological observation. Um, Hopkins, who has written a lot about picture perception, yes, summarizing quite a lot here, he would say uh, any philosophical account of perceiving a picture should be able to explain how we have this sort of integrated Con integrated experience of, this two co of these two contents simultaneously. Okay? And I'm going to come back to what theories of picture perception we should be thinking about a little bit later. All I want to do now is push the similarity phenomenologically between seeing a picture and hearing a recording. Think about me playing back a recording of a galloping horse. In a way, you would hear a horse galloping. In a way, if I play it back on my not very good mobile phone, you're kind of hearing you're kind of hearing the speaker as well. Okay, so I want to say that the speaker should be thought of as the equivalent as the, as the auditory equivalent of the canvas. Okay, so I sometimes get a bit of pushback on this, um, and so yeah, this, if this is if you want to pick away at my theory, this might be a way to, to pick away. Um, remember, five minutes ago, I told you about the sort of properties that I think we hear objects as bearing. Things like size, things like material constitution. I think we hear these properties when we hear speakers playing back audio. Okay, so you can certainly tell the difference between my cheap plastic mobile phone speaker and a uh, 700 euro hi-fi speaker. Okay, you can tell. And if I say to you, who, if I make you close your eyes and say which speaker is bigger, you're going to clearly point at the hi-fi one. If I say which one is made of cheap plastic and which one's not, you're going to point at the phone. Okay, so I want to say that you're hearing the horse, but you're also hearing the speaker and some of its properties in the same way that you're seeing the horse and you're seeing the canvas and some of its properties. Okay, I'm just going to try and pump this intuition a little bit more. Uh, my French accent is embarrassingly bad. Uh, but if you look, you'll see the trombe Someone who speaks better French than me can say it in their heads. Uh, you can also have tricks of the ears as well. So, like I said, you can sometimes have auditory, auditory recordings which fool you. Okay? In the same way, sometimes you get pictures which, at first glance, do not look like pictures. They look like real things. So, we've seen one of like the boy and it looks like he's climbing through the window. You know what these pictures, what I mean by these pictures? Okay, so you can you have some sort of equivalence here. 
Uh, you also have noticing an aspect, which I'll demonstrate to you in a moment, and I think that can be comparable to something called sine wave speech. Okay, so aspect noticing, this might be familiar to some of you. We all seen this picture before? No? Can anyone tell me what this picture is a picture of? Good. A Dalmatian, in fact. Can everyone see it now? Mm. I see a tree. I see a tree. I thought I was seeing a pig. <laughs> Here is a dog's back leg. Here is his front leg. Here is his head. Here is his back. You see it now? Yeah, and then it looks maybe like a tree and a shadow over here. Yeah, yeah. Okay, what is interesting, and everyone, so some people there have the experience of not seeing it, and as soon as I tell you, you see it, right? So this is an interesting, sometimes we, pictures have this sort of snap phenomenology. I want to show you something which can be thought equivalent. In the, so I'm just, again, this is, this is just to pump your intuitions that recordings are like pictures. Oh, I'm going to have to do it like this, aren't I? Is this going to fit? Damn. Bear with me a second. Slight technical hitch. Yep. Let's just take a moment. Does anyone know what I mean by sine wave speech while I do it? No? Okay, so hopefully this will be heard. Ah, present to play video. Hopefully I'm not going to deafen you. Just give you that again. Now, listen to this. Jazz and swing fans like fast music. Everyone hear that? Everyone hear what he said? Jazz and swing fans like fast music. Now, hopefully this will be loud enough for you to hear. Come on, come on, come on. No, 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 no. I'm going to play you the original again. Jazz and swing fans like fast music. Can everyone hear that? So nice again. So again, what you know doesn't it's not that you're just working this out, but you can actually. Yes, we like that. You. Cool. No, you can. Kind of, it's interesting what you know can influence what you perceive, and so again, all I'm trying to do here is pump the intuition that recordings are phenomenologically quite like pictures. Okay, I'm going to say a bit, well, a lot more about that in the next twenty minutes or so. We started at about quarter past, right? A bit later than three, something like. Okay, now, we're going to get to the event part in just a second. So, what I've said so far is that recordings should be thought of as images of source events. Okay, and I've just tried to at least give you some feeling for what I mean by that idea. Okay? Now, you might think, um, actually, a better analogy here is um, movies, not pictures. Okay, a picture represents a scene, a static scene, right? You just see that, if you look at a photo, you just see one freeze frame, okay? Whereas an auditory recording uh, presents you with events, if I'm right, okay? So you might think, well, actually, mm, this is, a better analogy is not pictures, but movies, the videos here, okay? Notice, if you say this, you can say, well, you still get this twofold experience in movies as well, right? Because when you're watching a movie, you get to see the screen, and probably is that, and you get to see what is being played on that screen. Okay? But, in what follow, this is, this, basically comparing hearing events to seeing events, and recordings of events to video recordings of events, I think brings out a really interesting and quite fundamental difference between how we hear the world and how we see the world. Okay? So, here are some differences between hearing recorded audio and seeing recorded video. Okay. First of all, they decompose differently. 
Uh, if you take a video on your phone and then open it up on Final Cut Pro or whatever, whatever it is you have on your computer, you can split up that video into individual frames, right? I mean, if you have an old school movie projector, you can see frame, 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 okay? It's made up of these static images. And if you wanted, you could take one static image, blow it up, and now you have a nice picture of just one tiny instant of your movie, okay? Audio, audio that does not decompose in the same way. If you took a recording of a, a bowling ball being rolled and you slice it up on an audio program on your computer, you do not find that you get little slices of which, when you listen to them, you have an auditory experience of a static ball at different moments down the, the bowling alley. Okay? In fact, you never hear or really have any auditory experience, either artificial or real life, of an entirely static object, of an object not involved in an event. Okay? So th this is one reason to think that we're hearing and seeing events in events in quite different ways. Yeah. Everyone clear what I mean by this one? Sometimes I don't explain it quite so clearly. Okay. Two more uh, ways that hearing audio and seeing video come apart. Second one, uh, reversal, quite simply. Uh, if you have a video of a horse galloping and you play it backwards, you get the event of a horse galloping backwards. Okay? If you have a recording of a an audio recording of a horse galloping, and you play backwards, you get like that, right? You know that, that familiar sort of backwards the um, so you, you don't get yeah, you don't get an event in reverse. Okay. okay. Third, um, people don't believe me with this one, but this is I promise you this is true, you can Google this, which is removing the very beginning, this is the attack transients part. Video recording of a, let's say a man, it's a five second video of a man jumping up and throwing, putting a basketball into a hoop. Okay? If I remove even the first two seconds of that event, so that it starts with the man in mid-air, in mid-jump, and then doing it, and I say, what have you just seen? You'll be able to say, hey, I just saw a man. And you can, you can work out what event you're seeing on that video. Okay? What's very interesting in auditory perception is this does not work. So what you can do you can get a very familiar sounding uh, instrument and you can take off the first few hundreds of milliseconds of that instrument. So it's just being played once, first few hundreds of milliseconds, and then it is unrecognizable. Even to, well, at least it's a great deal more difficult to recognize, even to players of orchestral instruments, even to experts in this. Let me see if I can give you a second or a trade bit here. No, no, no. So, hopefully this won't deafen you either. That is a recording of a familiar instrument. Anyone want to hazard a guess what I'm playing there? Excuse me? A what? Contrabass. Uh, I know it is not one of those either. Okay. Now that's this is it without. Now I'm, now I'm going to add back on the beginning of the of the hearing. Exactly. And all I've done is take off a few hundred milliseconds. And so, so what I'm trying to push here is that yeah, auditory recordings and visual recordings seem to just behave really quite different from each other. And like I said, this seems to point to quite a fundamental way that hearing is different to seeing, and hearing events is different to seeing events. Which brings us to persistence and perdurance and endurance. I told you earlier on that I think we hear and see pretty much the same things, objects doing stuff. Okay, and I said that we hear and see them in a different way, or we hear them in a different way to how we see them. Okay, so now I'm going to elaborate a bit more on the difference between hearing and seeing events, as I see it. Okay, so very broadly, in the metaphysics <coughs> of persistence, there are two competing views about how objects persist across time. So here I'm not talking about perception of objects, I'm talking about how objects exist, how objects persist.
Okay, so endurantism is the one that is, I suspect a lot of you guys know this already, right? Endurantism is the one that says objects are fully present at every instant that they exist. Okay, so this is, this is, the, this is the sort of the everyday conception of how objects persist through time. Okay, that they're fully present at every instant that they're there. Okay, so bowling balls, for example, we think of enduring. Okay? Other types of thing, though, things like uh, bowling matches, purge you. Okay, they are not fully complete at any instant of their existence, but rather exist. They have temporal parts. They have beginning parts, middle parts, and end parts. They, yeah, have temporal parts at different moments in time. Okay, someone like David Lewis would say that we, um, yeah. Metaphysically, objects in fact perjure rather than endure. Okay, this debate I think is still going on in with metaphysicians. Okay, endurance, perjurance, stage theory as well. Okay. I'm not going to take a stand, a metaphysical stand here, but what I am interested in here is endurance and perjurance present us with two ways that we might think of objects as being perceptually represented, as objects being perceived. Okay, so I said that the common sense metaphysical view would be that objects injure, they're fully present. Okay, and then you've got the slightly less, yeah, less intuitive view such as Lewis, they perjure. Now, Prosser thinks that objects metaphysically perjure, but he thinks that we see them as injuring. Okay, so this is Simon Prosser, and he says, um, he's talking about change perception. So when you see an object moving, it's changing its location. Or when you see an object changing its color, for example. So a chameleon changing from red to, to green. Okay, and he says, in order for there to be representation of change, there must also be a representation of something that retains its strict identity through the change. The very same thing is F, say red, and then not F, not red. Okay, whatever the truth may be about the metaphysics of persistence. So he thinks that we, one way of putting it, yeah, we visually represent objects as enduring, not perjuring. Okay? Uh, you can find this in many other, you can sort of, well, find this general view in many other uh, views of sort of philosophical views of vision as well. Uh, Benson Anna would say something similar. I think Mohan, Man Mohan Matten could also be interpreted as saying something similar as well. That we see objects as these enduring things, the properties of which can change but we still see the object as the same object through the change. Okay? Focusing a bit more on how we see uh, change, people often talk about a structural feature of visual experience called the specious present. It comes from James originally, uh, to explain how we see change. Okay, so Next slide. Okay, so James remarked, yeah, so there is change that is quick enough for us to actually see the change, and there are some changes in the world which are, objects are moving or are changing, but they're doing it too slow for us to be able to see the change. Okay, so the classic example is the difference between the second hand on a clock, seconds hand on a clock, and the hour hand on a clock. Okay. You can see one of them going in front of you, you can't see the other one moving, even though it actually is moving. Okay. The specious presence is a way of trying to explain why we can see some change and why we cannot see some other change. Okay. The specious present is, in some of the recent literature, thought of as a temporal field, okay. equivalent to the visual spatial field. Okay, so... Um, I'll show you this. So here we've got a red gradient. Okay, so going from black on one side to red on the other. Okay, if you stand too close to that, if you went right up to the screen, you would see just a single shade of red. Okay, because you would not be able to see enough of the, the variation within your one visual field to actually be able to see the variation. Take a few steps back so you can take the whole of the screen into your spatial field. You will see the variation. Okay, all in one go, see the variation. If you think that the specious present, that, this, that we take in the world a second and a half at a time, the time, if you think of that as a field as well, that can be used to explain the difference between uh, seeing change and not being able to see change. So when you can't see the change, when you're looking at the hour hand and the change is too slow, 
people have suggested that this is kind of similar to being too close to the screen. Okay? Although there is a gradient, it's not within your, your, your field, so you're not able to perceptually experience the gradient. However, if this changes a bit faster, this would be equivalent to taking a few steps back, so you can see the whole gradient in front of you, and then you see the, gra you see the gradient of the space, or you see the change in time, if the change can be fitting in in your second and a half temporal field. Okay. Now, I think that's a good account of how we see events in vision, how we see objects changing, or we see objects moving. Okay. I do not think it is a very good way of explaining how we hear events, okay, for reasons which should become clear. Okay. I think that even if we see objects as enduring, we hear objects as perduring. When I hear a, a ball being rolled, I hear it to perdure through time in a particular way. If I hear that same ball being dropped, I hear it to perdure through time in a different way. Okay? The way I think we should think about this is, again, to keep this temporal field, spatial field metaphor going. The spatial field allows us to see gradients in property, like I've just shown you, red to black. The spatial field also allows us to see shape. Okay? Seeing this bottle as bottle-shaped and seeing this Bluetooth speaker as uh, beer can-shaped okay? seems to me to depend upon the spatial field. The spatial field allows you to see how objects extend through space. If I was too close to the bottle or too close to the uh, Bluetooth speaker, I would not be able to see the shape of the object because it would be too big for my spatial field to fit it all in. I want to say something very, very similar is happening with our temporal field when we hear objects. So, we're not, so when we hear events. So, yeah, a drop ball is heard to extend over time in one way and a roll ball is heard to extend over time in another. Okay, just to push this a little bit more. Okay. Um, so again, these, sort of, these are sort of two little pairs of analogous things, I think. Yeah. Okay. You can see the same material to be in shaped differently through your spatial field. Okay, so you see that this is made of sort of greenish plastic, greenish transparent plastic. Possibly we could melt this down, remold it into a sphere. And then if I had another bottle like this and the sphere, you could say, ah, well, it's the same stuff. I can see it's made out of the same green transparent plastic, but it's extending through space in a different way. So this one seems ball shaped. This one seems bottle shaped. Okay? I want to say that that is analogous to hearing the same object taking, play, taking part in different events. Okay? Plastic extending through space differently. Ball being rolled extends through space in one way, extends across the temporal field in one way. Ball being dropped is the object extending across your temporal field in another. And the opposite is true as well. You can have the same shape with different materials. Okay, so you can have a plastic bottle, a wooden bottle, a plastic ball, a wooden ball. And you can say, hey, well, it's the same shaped object because it's extending over my spatial field in the same way, but I can also see that it's made out of a different color, sorry, different material, and it's a different color. Okay, but the difference is in the way it's extending. I want to say that this is similar in how we hear events. Okay, events happening, so the same event happening to different objects. Okay, so a bottle being dropped on the ground, I want to say has a similar temporal shape to a metal ball being dropped on the ground. Okay, um, just before I go to that last little bit, this sometimes helps people understand what I'm trying to talk about here. So here are two uh, spectrograms of different auditory events. One is a rolling, one is a collision. You can probably guess just from looking which one is which, right? This one? Yeah, exactly, right? And if you, if you record loads and loads of collisions, they all have more... This is like an idealised version, I think. This is, I think, a, a kick drum. But uh, if all collisions will have something like this type of shape on a spectrogram, and I think we're hearing something like this only in time rather than over space. 
This will be a rolling, and again you can kind of see it's kind of got more or less the same temporal shape as other things being rolled as well. So metal things wouldn't get this sort of stuff. Obviously, the materials that these objects were made out would also have an effect on the exact temporal shape, but it's still going to have this sort of arc for collisions and this sort of thing for rollings. Okay. Final board. Yeah, coming up about 10 minutes to go, is that right? Uh, well, go ahead. I mean, it's so you could think, so mm -hmm. I think the other is also going to I hope not. I'll try and get a, yeah. get a bit along. Okay. Well, it's five or seven, then I'll see what I can do. Um, just a couple of very quick points then about this. If you go with me with the Temple Field, um, Temple Field also explains why we never hear inactive objects. I can see a bottle doing nothing, standing there. Imagine the water's not moving. You just see it doing just a bottle. But you never hear just a bottle. You always hear a bottle rolling, a bottle being thrown, a bottle being opened, stuff like that. I want to say that the reason why we only ever hear objects as involved in events is similar for the reason that we only ever see objects as being shaped as well. You, because you have a visual spatial field, you cannot but see objects as shaped. Because you have a temporal field, you cannot but hear objects as having some sort of temporal. Okay, so back to depiction and back to recordings. So early on I gave you some sort of phenomenological reasons for thinking that hearing recordings is similar to seeing pictures. And I also said that there are actually loads of philosophical views on what depiction amounts to. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you briefly how what I've just said about temporal shape can be thought to fit in with a particular view of what depiction amounts to. So Hopkins again. Hopkins is, puts forward what's known as a resemblance theory of depiction. And he says, what is crucial for pictorial representation is, he's talking about visual pictures here of course, uh, is that the marks are experienced as resembling the depicted object. And to experience this resemblance is to see the object in the picture. Okay? Resemblance theorists disagree about in what way the marks on the paper should re resemble the real life object or the object that is being depicted. Okay? Hopkins, summarized by Kovicki here, this is not Kovicki's view, but I think he summarizes Hopkins quite well. He talks about, Hopkins talks about um, outline shape. So if the marks on the canvas resemble the material object in outline shape, then we experience this resemblance, and then we see that object as being in that picture. Outline shape is the shape things have if we ignore the dimension of depth. Okay, so what the idea here with outline shapes, imagine you look at this book, and I'm holding it at this angle, okay? And then you, you are seeing it through, say, through glass, and you go on the glass, and then you draw just the angles that cover this. Okay, so even though this is square, what you're going to draw on the glass is going to be some sort of quadrilateral. quadrilateral. You know what I mean here? Some sort of uh, parallelogram. Clear? Okay, and Hopkins says that it's not, yeah, that's how you get different angles of different pictures in different pictures, because you're drawing it as having different outline shapes. This is about perspective in drawing. Okay. So what you've done when you blow when you blow on the window and shift it out is you're abstracting away from the three-dimensional shape and you're just getting this two-dimensional outline shape. I want to say something similar is happening in auditory, sorry, in experiences of recordings. Okay. I want to say that we experience a recording as resembling something in temporal shape which leads to the deployment of a concept of what the recording depicts. Because we don't hear objects as being three-dimensional, I haven't said that much about that today, but, we do, but you cannot hear the shape, the spatial shape of an object. You just hear the object. There's no need to do what Hopkins needs to do for pictures, because we don't need to ignore the dimension of depth, because audition does not really have this depth in the first place. What I want to say is hearing temporal shape depends upon the properties of the object, whether it's extending through time in a collision-y sort of way, or a rolling-y sort of way, and how it's extending across our temporal field. Okay. And this is how I think we should think of recordings as depicting what they're recordings of. 
by, resembl by experienced resemblance through temporal shape. If you go with this on, if you agree with me on this, in fact, recordings are more like pictures than they are like movies, because both pictures and recordings rely on resemblance in the way objects extend through space. Two more slides, then I'm done. Final interesting thing about this. Oh, sorry, three more slides, then I'm done. This explains decomposition and reversal and transience. Okay, so again, use this shape, spatial shape, auditory temporal shape analogy. Cutting a picture of a circle does not lead to little pieces of circularity. Cutting up a recording of a horse galloping does not lead to little bits of horse or little bits of gallop or little bits of hoof. Cut up a circle, you just get little bits of something. Cut up a recording, you just get little bits of something. Explains reversal as well. Uh, imagine a triangle in front of you. Turn that triangle upside down. It looks very different. Okay, it looks point here, flap it here, as opposed to flap it here, point here. I want to say something similar is going on when you hear a recording being reversed. It's equivalent to turning an irregular shape upside down. And finally, back to the cutting off the beginnings of recordings. Uh, basically, cutting off the beginning of a recording, like I showed you with the piano, impedes recognition. Arguably, cutting off the top of a shape or the side of a shape impedes recognition of that shape for what it is. So if I show you this, and I've covered up that part, you don't know whether it's going to be straight here or round here or spiky here because I'm covering that part. So you can't really identify the object properly unless I remove that. Finally. Should I just stop here? No, I'm going to keep going. Sorry, two more minutes. Um, Hopkins' idea for outline shape and pictures he also says that his view, res resemblance in outline shape view, allows for non-naturalistic depictions as well. Okay? He's, so, when you, so basically, clearly you can say a photograph of a book resembles the book in outline shape. But what about if I've done like, like a rough charcoal sketch? Or what if a three-year-old has done something with a crayon? I mean, because oh, it's a picture of a book. But you can also say, well, the outline shape is really quite different between these two objects. Okay, Hopkins would say the following in response to this, because he thinks his view works for these non-naturalistic types of depiction as well. He says, one might represent the table shape very precisely, while another represents it as merely roughly round. For pictorial content to be imprecise is for there to be no answer beyond a certain level of detail as to which two distinct properties the picture ascribes to the object. It is clear that pictures can have imprecise content. This is the important thing for me. A quick sketch might represent nothing more than a figure's rough shape and posture. Uh, it should be equally clear that the resemblance can allow for this feature of depiction. As we saw, what, is matter, what matters is experienced resemblance to the object depicted. There is no reason why marks should not be experienced as resembling something with fairly indeterminate properties. Okay? And he wants to say that as long as we allow that resemblance can be quite indeterminate, or experience resemblance shape can be of in quite indeterminate way, this allows for non-naturalistic depiction, such as impressionism, such as children's drawings. If you go along with me and you think resemblance and experience and outline shape also work with recordings, you also get non-naturalistic auditory depiction as well. I really won't say very much about this now, but I'm just going to try and... I thought this was quite a nice way to finish. Um, first of all, we can think about synthesis, okay? So, a lot of the music now, for example, is made with synthesized instruments, okay? So, everyone knows what a hi-hat is? No. Hi-hat is the symbol on a drum kit that goes... Tss, 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 that one, okay? Listen to any modern music, though, and they haven't really recorded a drum going... Tss, They've made a synthesizer make that tss, okay? And you can normally tell the difference, right? You can say, well, that's a real recording of a hi-hat or a drum or a guitar, and that's a synthesized thing. And the synthesized thing sounds kind of like the, the real hi-hat, but it's also clearly a, an electronic thing, something that's been created by a computer. Okay? I want to say that the, this sort of vague similarity between the real and the synthesized can be thought of as having rough indeterminate similarities in temporal shape and our experience resemblance of temporal shape. Similar thing can be said about sample manipulation as well. Take a recording of somebody's voice or a drum loop, slow it down a little bit, 
you can tell that it's not a natural voice or a natural drum, drum beat, but you can also still recognize what it is. And again, I think it's because there's still a rough resemblance in, there's an experience of rough resemblance in temporal shape. Finally, 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 I want to show you, you guys all saw Charlie Brown when you were kids, right? Do you remember how the adults spoke in Charlie Brown? I think this is quite a good way of illustrating what I mean by non-naturalistic auditory depiction. And I'm going to finish with this. Go to press play. Okay, so okay, that I would like to try and argue on the view I've presented here with depiction is not a symbolic representation of a person speaking. It is a non-naturalistic auditory depiction. Actually, a trombone and somebody moving the wah wah in and out of a trombone. Uh, and I want to say that, that the reason why that sounds kind of like a voice and kind of like a boring voice is because it is in some way experienced as resembling in temporal outline shape the sound of somebody speaking or somebody speaking as it were. So, to conclude, I've argued that soundless audition is a viable option and that we've seen uh, recordings present a possible problem for the view that I've given you. Um, I then try to show you that pictures and recordings are actually phenomenologically quite similar. And I've put forward an account of what it is to hear events, to hear objects, that explains the difference between pictures and recordings. Things I need to think about with this view uh, as I go forward. The, yeah, hearing events seems to me to be kind of interestingly connected to our experience of time passing. Okay, so in a way, hearing a recording is still quite different from seeing a picture because you can see a picture in an instant. Whereas part of hearing a recording is it takes time, you kind of experience the recording going on and going through and passing. Okay? That seems to be an interesting sort of route for me to go down. Um, another thing you might want to worry about is whether there's a the mismatch between seeing objects as enduring and hearing them as perduring. So we know that different perceptual modalities interact and influence one another. Think about the ventriloquist effect. Okay? What you hear affects what you see, and what you see affects what you hear there. So is it going to be a problem to say that we see enduring things but hear things as perduring? Okay? And these sort of multimodal interactions. And the third thing is a huge hole in my account of audition is music. Okay, and I don't think that's a big problem for me, but it's certainly something that would be nice to try and put this stuff on. I've talked a lot. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>